Jesus came to this earth with an uncompromised and laser-focused passion to establish his kingdom among its inhabitants who have been taken captive by the devil to do his will. What he accomplished through his direct assault on Satan and his armies has opened the way for his ongoing conquest of the entire earth through the people he's delivered. Though all authority has been given to Jesus in both heaven and earth, our King is still establishing his dominion across this planet through his devoted followers. The earth is presently the stage of a fierce battle between a defeated enemy resistance and the forces of an army indwelt by their victorious King. The outward and internal suffering, sin and delusion all around us are the effects of a spiritual onslaught of darkness just veiled to our earthly eyes. Presently ruling at his Father's right hand, our Captain, Jesus, is seeking to set the earth's captives free from their enslavement to the devil in the same way that he did when he walked among us. The age-old strategy of Satan and his legions is that of deception. Many who claim to follow Jesus are quite unaware of the battle raging around them. They've been deluded, distracted, disarmed, and ultimately disengaged in the ongoing conflict between the King of Heaven and the spiritual hosts of wickedness seeking to devour the inhabitants of the earth. My burden is to sound an awakening trumpet and to call all able bodies to war. I want to bring clarity to the reality of what is really going on around us. I want to bring clear understanding of what Christ came to this earth to accomplish and what the battle plan is until his ultimate return. I desire to highlight the victorious authority that has been given to Jesus and extended to us in his conquest of the earth. I want to unearth and remove the dust of uselessness from the powerful weapons of warfare that are available to us. I want us as a community of disciples of Jesus to band together and advance in taking ground that no longer belongs to the enemy. I want to correct the delusion that the church's mission is to peacefully do its thing alongside the world of filth while we do our best to not get dirty. I want to uncomfortably highlight the complacency, fear, selfishness, and ultimately the lack of love that prevents us from seriously engaging in the spiritual warfare that rages all around us. What are we doing? Why are we here? Right now, what motives are at the core of our hearts? What consumes us on a daily basis? What is the power to bring tears to our eyes? What's in our dreams? What's in our waking thoughts? How serious do we evaluate the situation of reality? What did Jesus really accomplish? What burns in his heart right now? How long do we have? Is anything more important? How do our lives answer these questions? We really need to wake up. Let's get some vision. Let's not go down in history as just another generation that did our best to get along with each other while we waited for Jesus to come back and rescue us. Let's not be like every other man in Israel except David who stood fear-stricken because of the size of the enemy. Let's not be like those who missed the kingdom over land, work, and family. Let's catch a glorious glimpse of the kingdom Jesus established and throw heart, soul, mind, and strength into the conflict he began and still tirelessly pursues. Let's get a fresh look at the big picture. Let's let what consumes Jesus be that which is our obsession. Have you grown to appreciate the scriptures? Has the Bible become a precious book to you? It has to me because it contains the word of God. And I can bank on the fact that it's true. Did you know that the central character of the Bible, the key figure, is obviously Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, Jesus, our King. He was the one that said to the Pharisees who were questioning him, he said, you search the scriptures because in them you think that you have eternal life, but these are they that testify of me. But you won't come to me that you might have life. If we're not led to Jesus in our study of the scriptures, we're missing the whole point. If we're not coming into a real relationship with him, somehow we're just getting caught up in knowledge. We're just getting caught up in religion, much like many people of Jesus' day who actually proved to be his worst enemies. Well, Jesus is the central figure, but did you know what the central theme is? 
The central theme of the scriptures is the kingdom of God. You might be thinking, oh, I thought the gospel was the central theme. See, that's the thing. The gospel is good news about the kingdom of God. I want to read you a scripture. When Jesus started preaching, this is how it describes his ministry in Mark chapter 1. It says, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. And he said this, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. You see, the good news is good news about something. That something is the kingdom of God. Jesus being the central figure, you see, it's not just Jesus, but Jesus the Christ. It's his kingship, the Messiah. It's his whole plan and the vision that's in his heart for what he came to establish. So today I want to tackle the question, what is the kingdom of God? How can we really understand it? How can we capture that description that Jesus gave in his parables or what was in his heart? What was he talking about when he said the term, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven? Jesus said that the gospel that's to be preached to the end of the world is called the gospel of the kingdom. That message about his kingship and the realm in which he reigns over being spread throughout the whole world and then the end shall come. So why did Jesus primarily use the imagery of a kingdom? Let's talk about what a kingdom is. A kingdom simply defined is a society in which a king reigns over. So the kingdom of God is the society that God reigns over as king. That's really what was in Jesus' mind in its simplicity when he talked about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is the realm in which the will of God is done. Jesus taught us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See, God has a will, God has a desire. God has a way that he wants things to operate for our good. If God were to have his way, if we could ask ourselves, what if God just had his way? What if we just let God totally have his way with the world? What if we trusted him so much that we just said, you lead, you're in control, you're in charge. I trust you, I trust your provision, I trust your protection, I trust your law and your wisdom, your rules, and I just want to live underneath the beautiful reign of your hand and of your heart. That's the kingdom of God. I want to read something to you. Actually, this is from a book by Steve Gregg, and I really appreciate his definition of the kingdom. He says, the kingdom is an alternative society on earth, a global colony of King Jesus who reigns over the personal and corporate lives of his citizens or disciples, having designs on the conquest of every soul until every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God. Thus, we're not saved primarily for our own eternal enjoyment of happier conditions, nor to swell the ranks of some religious institution. We are saved to become serviceable members of a global corporate body, loyalists to the rightful king in a world of rebels and participants in his conquest over the hearts and minds of all the inhabitants of the world. Our prayers, our preaching, and our efforts all have as their goal that God's kingdom will come, that is, be fully realized as a victorious phenomenon in history among the people subject to Christ, and that the Father's will would be done on this earth as it is in heaven. This society of people, this colony of loyalists to the king here in enemy territory that Jesus came and he set up and he presently is ruling over and reigning over. This is what the kingdom of God is. And Jesus has invited all of us into it through his blood, through his death, through his resurrection. What is the kingdom of God? Let's look deeper into it. It's exciting. Let's let it stir our hearts. When Jesus came to set up his kingdom, he came into very hostile territory. 
There was a lot that resisted the kingdom that Jesus wanted to set up. A lot of misunderstanding to what he was coming to do. People wanted to be delivered from Rome. He came to deliver them from Satan. They wanted to be delivered from poverty. He came to deliver them from sin. Jesus had a much bigger vision in his heart of what people needed to be delivered from and how they needed to be governed. Not just the generation that lived while he was alive on this earth, but for all generations. And Jesus came with that vision. He came and he proclaimed it. And I want to just focus on two different modes of resistance that really came against Jesus' vision of the kingdom of God. Remember, the kingdom of God is the realm in which the will of God is accomplished. Two main things that were resisting that will. Number one, our sinful nature, self-centeredness. That was one of the huge problems that Jesus came and he battled against. Our own will, our own desires that are contrary to love, self-centered, unloving attitudes that have caused all the problems and still cause all the problems in the world today. Jesus came and he saw the true issue was sin in the human heart. And so he didn't see Israel as in bondage more than Caesar who sat on the throne of Rome. He saw everybody in bondage, in need of his deliverance, and he came as a savior from so much more than, than Rome or some physical oppressor or something like that. Jesus came with a heart to set us free from ourselves, and he did. He actually accomplished that through his death, his resurrection, through his ascension and the sending of his Holy Spirit. Jesus came on the scene, and when he announced the kingdom of God, he used the term repent. He didn't say enlist, the kingdom is at hand. He didn't say sign up. He didn't say get your arms and get ready for war, the kingdom is here. No, he said repent. He brought it right into the heart of every single person. His forerunner, John the Baptist, started that message, repent, because the kingdom of heaven is here, it's at hand. You need to deal with your heart. You see, John, he came before Jesus, and Jesus said that the law and the prophets were until John, since then the kingdom of heaven is preached. And many are pressing into it. And John, that message that he brought was that every valley must be brought up and every mountain must be brought low. And he was telling everybody to be baptized and to bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. Change your life, change your perspective, wake up, open your eyes. Because the realm of God in which his will is done, it's, it's coming, it's here. Because the king is here. And so, this is why so many of Jesus' teachings centered around denying yourself, taking up your cross, losing your life abandoning your will to take up the will of God. To be utterly transformed on the inside. Because you see, the kingdom, he said, it doesn't come with observation. And you won't say, look here and look there, because the kingdom of God, he said, is within you. If the kingdom of God does not work inside of us and change us from the inside out, it has not accomplished its primary purpose. And so Jesus came to conquer the heart of every man and every woman, to bring us underneath his reign and his rule. And you know how he did that? By doing it himself.
God wants to bring us to a place where we stop resisting His will. That's when we truly come underneath His kingship, His reign. We say, yes, Lord, I trust you. You know how to govern me. I need to be governed by you. I need to be led. I need to be taught what's right and what's good. I'm self-centered. I have my own will and it's dangerous. I need to submit to you and let your will lead and guide me. That's one form of resistance that Jesus came and the hostility is the will of man, the contrary nature to the nature of God. Another resistance that Jesus faced was the kingdom of darkness. Jesus saw this as a reality that many people didn't quite see. When Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, remember Satan came to him and offered him all the kingdoms of the world. And Satan said something interesting. He said, for they've all been given to me and I give them to whom I wish. Jesus didn't contend that point. The kingdoms of this world are under the sway of the wicked one. The whole world lies in darkness, the scriptures tell us, under the sway of the wicked one. Jesus actually called the devil the ruler of this world, the God of this age. He's the prince of the power of the air, the scriptures tell us. And Jesus said he had a kingdom. He said if Satan be, if this kingdom is divided against itself, how can it stand? How did Jesus wage this war against Satan? By modeling the kingdom that he came to establish. By submitting himself to the will of God by not choosing to do his own will, but the will of him who sent him. Jesus told the woman at the well, it's my meat, my food, to do and fulfill the will of him who sent me. Jesus said, I came here not to do my own will, but the will of my Father. I wanna read Philippians chapter two. It really shows us the heart of Jesus when he came. In fact, Paul tells us to let the same mind be in us that was in Christ when he came to this earth. Philippians chapter two. Says this. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on the earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. Do you see how his kingship, his enthronement, his exaltation is directly linked to his humility, to his decision to come and submit himself to the will of God? He became obedient to the Father, even to the point of death. Not one time did Jesus come out from underneath the reign of his Father, the rule he trusted his father in all things, even to the cross. And in fact, you really see it in his life there in the Garden of Gethsemane when he says, let this cup of suffering pass from me, Father, but nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. You see it right there, your will be done. Your kingdom come, your will be done. He really meant that. That's what he really prayed. That's how he really lived. And that's how he's calling us to live. He came against the enemy by submitting himself to the reign and rule of his father. And because of that, he's been given the highest name. He's been seated in heavenly places. God raised him from the dead. And now we get to participate in that kingdom. He made a way for us to enter in. And you know, it's the same way that he entered in. He said, if anyone wants to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow after me. That's the essence of the kingdom of God. That's the essence of living underneath the reign of God. You've got to stop resisting his will. That's where his commandments come in. You know, the commandments of Jesus Christ are a revelation of his will. If they're burdensome to you or you don't like them, it's really because there's something wrong with your heart or with my heart. I've got to admit some of the teachings of Jesus are hard. And I don't like them naturally. But 
If I trust God and I truly want to come underneath his reign and I believe that it's right for my life, his commandments become a revelation of his will. It's what he desires. And for me to come underneath that and say, yes, Lord, that's good for me. I want to be like you. I want to live like you. I trust you. That's how Jesus lived. And that's how he's calling us to live as well. But Jesus knows that we can't live that way on our own. Jesus knows that we need to have a new birth from above. This old nature can't just be denied and resisted. It needs to be eradicated. So Jesus, when he was talking to Nicodemus, he said to him, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. There needs to be a new birth inside of us. Again, he said, unless you're born of water and of the spirit, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. See, the kingdom of God isn't something you just sign up for and just decide you're going to do without a real miraculous birth and a uh, transformation on the deepest part of who you are. And so Jesus made provision for that. When he died for us and he fulfilled the will of God perfectly and modeled that for us, he didn't just say, okay, now just do your best to do what I did. No, he said, identify by faith with my death, with my resurrection, and let me live my life inside of you and set up my kingdom on the depth of who you are. It's such an awesome kingdom. He's such an awesome king. The way that we do this is by putting faith in our king, in the work that he did, in who he is. We identify with that by faith when we confess that he's Lord. We say with our mouth, you are the king. Ultimately, that's what we're saying when we call Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. You're the king. I confess that you are Lord. I believe in my heart that you were raised from the dead. And the way that we declare that by faith is through baptism. We go down in the water. We repent. We come up again buried with him in baptism, raised with him in the newness of life. And then it's so awesome, we're seated with him in heavenly places. I got to read this from Ephesians. This is chapter two. It says, and you he made alive who were dead in your trespasses and your sins. That's that self-life I was talking about. It just reflects selfishness and sins and trespasses against our king living a contrary way of the way of love and the kingdom that he came to set up. But hey, we've been made alive and we were dead in that, but we once conducted ourselves, it says, and walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. That's the devil. The spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also when we all conducted ourselves in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, I love this part, but God who's rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ. That's the throne that he was raised up to. We've been seated with him that in the ages to come, he may show us the exceeding riches of his grace, and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So awesome. We believe in the reality of what he's done. We come into alignment with that. We say, yes, Lord, I lay my will down. I lay my life down. I want to enter into your kingdom. I need a new birth from above. I need to be born of your spirit and of water. And here I come, Lord, I'm all in. Take me up and make me part of your kingdom. Make me a citizen that is underneath your reign. I wanna be governed by you. I wanna be led. I wanna be controlled by you. In my heart, in my life, in practical ways, I want you to flow out of my life. This is the reality of the kingdom of God. We must be born again. We must come in and have our old nature put to death so that we truly might live in him. We need to respond to what Jesus did and who he is in reality. We need to partake in his death so that we can experience his life. If 
view of your mercies, O oh God. that the King is reigning in your heart? Do you believe that Jesus lives in you, that he's able to set you free from the reign and the rule of sin and the devil? Jesus did say, I came to this earth. The whole purpose that he was here was to destroy the works of the devil. Jesus, his vision for the kingdom needs to capture your heart and totally capture my heart as well. It needs to be what we seek first, his kingdom and his righteousness. It needs to be the primary desire of our life to let him establish his reign and rule in our hearts personally and then extend that out to those around us. Have you been under the impression that the kingdom of God is just somewhere that you go when you die? And that the gospel is only about you getting saved from hell and going to heaven? Sure, that's a fruit of the gospel and it's awesome and I'm thankful for that, I must admit. But the kingdom of God is such a bigger vision than that. And the gospel is something to be more excited about than just changing a destination. Are you in the kingdom of God right now? Are you here occupying until he comes, investing in what he's given you? I encourage you to get stoked about the kingdom of God, to really let this light a fire in your heart, make you excited every day to wake up and be involved in the advancement of this, this realm of the will of God being established on this earth. I want to encourage you to embrace every sacrifice that needs to be made in your life, every thing that you need to lay down in order for the will of God to be further accomplished. Don't resist his will. Submit to the loving rule and reign of Jesus. With every resignation, with every surrender, we're gaining ground in this battle of being centered in you. With every resignation, Every surrender, we're gaining ground in this battle of being centered in you. Win by losing, we live by dying, we rise by bowing.
upside